This is Git Minutes episode 46, which is probably going to be the final episode of Git Minutes ever. In this episode, we feature core Git developer Jeff or Pef King. Uh, the last interview uh, we did at Git Merge 2017 in, in Brussels. We talk about how Git itself changes to tackle the needs of uh, companies and users as uh, Git is uh, moving to support bigger and bigger projects of larger and larger scales. We also talk about the protection of the trademark Git. Unfortunately, the recording got cut slightly short because of some technical difficulties, so very sorry about that. Since this is probably the last Git Minutes episode, uh, there's going to be a little sentimental blabbering after the interview, so stay tuned if you're into that sort of stuff. Git Minutes is sponsored and hosted by DigitalOcean. Use the promo code GitMinutes10 when you sign up and uh, you'll get $10 worth of credit. I'm your host, Thomas Ferris Nikolaisen. You can find more information about the show on gitminutes.com. So, here's the interview with Pef. Okay, now I'm sitting here with uh, Pef again. Or, uh, like... We've we've talked in the past, and I'm always happy to to, to talk with uh, uh, with Pef or or Jeff King uh, because you are, let's say, uh, somebody who has a good overview over everything that's going on in uh, in Git core and also related things, and uh, and and you're not afraid to talk about them. I am not afraid to talk. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's just start uh, with the, with the conference. How, how, how's it going going? I think it's been good. Uh, we did the Contributor Summit yesterday, and uh, I think that was productive. It was really uh, a nice opportunity for uh, people from... Uh, there are a lot of companies now that are interested in Git and doing Git development. Uh, GitHub, obviously. Uh, Google, uh, which both of which have a history of contributing to the project. But then uh, Atlassian and GitLab both have an interest and are... Uh, haven't made a lot of contributions so far, but are obviously interested in certain topics and seeing seeing what they can do to help. Uh, and so I think that was a really uh, good step to get all of those people in the same room talking about the problems, realizing how much our problems are shared. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and especially, I know Atlassian, um, they're really interested in this sort of bundle clone idea, uh, and they're trying to figure out the right way to contribute to it. They're not, they're not usually C programmers. They're, uh, they have a lot of Go expertise and uh, figuring out how they can take their prototypes and actually get them into upstream Git. So hopefully we can all sort of work together on that. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems kind of in a, a bit, it's not the same problem, but it's a bit similar with the whole LF, LFS thing uh, where you kind of build, I mean, of course, that these bundles kind of go into the core mm -hmm. of Git itself. But uh, again, people take uh, a concept and they make it r write like an extension for it or whatever you call it right. in, in Go or some other language just to kind of make a spike and see if it works and with the hope of maybe later on this is finding that this is something we can get into uh, Git core. Yeah, I think in uh, LFS's uh, a case, it was it's a little bit different in the sense that I think we're going to... Uh, the LFS solution did a good job of sort of mixing the... Um, it needed to ask Git to do a few things differently, and then people were, who were interested in LFS submitted uh, patches, so sp especially around LFS is built around the clean and smudge filters. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and they, so, they just got some performance uh, right. fixes, yeah. Uh, and the nice thing, I thought they did a really nice job uh, of identifying... They had a problem, and identifying that... It was the, sort of the general parts of it, the, the parts of Git. What are the services Git could provide that would be not just to help LFS, but any similar process filter could be optimized using this. Wrote the general half of it in Git, and then wrote their half of it in LFS to take advantage of it. So I yeah. think it's sort of an everybody wins situation. And uh, yeah, n now with these uh, cloning bundles, um, they're doing a proof of concept, like again in a bit of a similar fashion, hacking a bit on the server, hacking a bit on the on a client, and then sharing it, like as yesterday, and then to get some feedback, which is, I mean, it was almost the most uh, 
interesting. Like we had a little voting process where people uh, put uh, uh, like a vote uh, to the most interesting subjects, and this was uh, the biggest one. Uh, except yeah. for, uh, maybe the big big repositories was had even more votes. <laughs> Every contributor summit, big repositories yeah. is the is the topic. I I mean, I think it's it's something we've known about and get for a really long time, and uh, uh, in some ways, I think it was uh, it was such a distant far distant goal, this idea of, uh, of this sort of mono repo, you know, the, yeah. this 300 gigabytes, you know, millions of files repository with all your developers working on it. Um, but I think uh, I'm, this is the first year where I haven't felt that it's this bizarre, far away, you know, goal that, oh, sure, we should do that, but, you know, eventually, uh, that uh, uh, Microsoft gave a talk in the main conference today uh, about I mean, that's the exact problem they're, they're looking at, looking at putting Windows source code in Git. Um, and I think they had to do a lot of really dirty hacks uh, to, to, to get it. Uh, I'd recommend actually people looking at the, uh, the talk. I don't know. And I, th I think they have a website with uh, their, is it GVFS, I think is the name of it. Okay. Uh, but it, it's a, it is a file system driver <laughs> that pretends to get like it has all of the loose objects and then downloads them on the fly, which seems dirty to me. Uh, <laughs> and and this, this might be another case where, okay, they're, they're going to prove that these concepts work. They're going to, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of these things, teaching Git to download ob blobs on the fly is not, that's only part of the job. The other part of the job is figuring out all of the logistics of well, how do you transfer the blobs and how do you think about deltas between blobs and how do you uh, deal with latency issues and, and how do you deal with commands where, oops, I ran git log and now I wanted to download all the blobs. Um, so they're getting experimental experience with these ideas uh, and they're going to smooth out some of these rough edges. And then I hope that eventually we get to a point one day where this is something Git can do and you don't have to have a custom file system driver yeah. uh, in order to do it. Um, but, you know, that's, that's how we make progress, this sort of incremental steps. So uh, I, I, I hate to, to, to like ask you for, for what changes were there in Git in the last year or anything like that. You can read my blog post. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to big repositories, if, if you compare to where we were uh, in uh, Berlin like four years ago, whatever that was, um, what has changed in Git to make it like better at handling these big repositories? Oh, well, there's, you know... Lots of little things. Lots of little things, yeah. I think that... Um, I think there are some a lot of big open topics still, but yeah, there's so many, I don't want to even call them micro-optimizations, but for instance, a couple months ago, I was working with the, um, uh, the Delta-based cache in Git, and so this is you know, the idea that you have to access uh, uh, several versions of an object, and, and they may be a delta of a delta of a delta, and so you don't want to compute them all the way down to the base each time, so you keep this cache. Uh, of the intermediate steps, um, and you could size the cache. And if you have a large repository, um, something like the size of the Linux kernel, um, you actually benefit things like Git log, um, and especially Git log if you're uh, uh, generating the patches, will um, benefit greatly from bumping the cache size. But the data structure that powered the cache was too naive. And so at some point, bumping the size of the cache just didn't help. It actually made things worse. Oh. Uh, and so, so I took a look at that and did a, lot, but did a bunch of timings and said, well, what's, and, you know, what's the optimal cache size? How can we, uh, can we replace it with a smarter data structure? And ended up with that. And so I, I don't remember the, the exact numbers, but some operations are, are you know, 30 or 40% faster, you know, just sort of for free without even bumping the cache size. And if you have a large repository and you just want to throw a little more RAM at it, then suddenly your operations can get quite a lot faster because mm. uh, we spend less time, so we spend less time inflating the same object data over and over and over again. Yeah. So there are now like a lot more. I mean, the, the, the vanilla Git repository will just be faster even when yeah. it uh, grows to much larger sizes than it used to in the past. Right, or and it will stay fast much longer. Yeah, th those are the most satisfying optimizations too, because uh, you know. This, I think the work Microsoft was doing uh, is good, but man, there are a lot of things to configure and a lot of hacks and a lot of special cases and oh, you're running this server that's serving all the objects. 
if you can just say, well, you know, I changed uh, 20 lines of code, and uh, as soon as you upgrade, it'll just magically be faster. That's that's a lot more satisfying. Mm -hmm. Um, so, are, are you? Do you get a bit? I don't know if you saw the the Facebook talk, but you've certainly heard about the you know the big their big mono repo. Uh, do you ever get like a bit envious of uh, of how they can just plug in stuff in their extensions and just <laughs> how that stuff um, works? Envious isn't the right word. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I think one of the things. Git has a kind of a crufty architecture in a way. Uh, it's really, really great for plugging in new commands entirely. To uh, uh, you, you don't even have to write them in Python. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the innards are of Git are more brittle. I would I've never worked on Mercurial, but my impression is is the innards of Git are a little more brittle. Um, but I I don't think that's really the thing that holds us back on a lot of these. A lot of it is. Um, Dealing with backwards compatibility and on disk formats and, and mm. things like that. And um, it's just uh, one, like, so for example, one of, the, um, one of the problems we've had, for example, is uh, a ref storage is kind of slow when you have a very large number of refs. And there's been work happening to refactor the, the brittle git backend code, and that work has gone well. And now we have this sort of virtualized storage interface for refs. And now is the time where we plug in a better format. Okay. Um, and and we've, you know, we've, we've done the hard part. The, the code is there, the backwards compatibility flags and the configure there, so, you know, so a new uh, or an old version of Git doesn't accidentally destroy your repository because it doesn't understand the new storage format. Uh, and so there's a question, well, what is the best key value database to use to store the refs? And it's just a harder question than you might think because we care a lot about dependency management. Uh, what databases are going to be available everywhere? What databases have a pure Java version that we can also uh, uh, ship with JGit? And I, when I say we ship with JGit, I don't, I don't work on JGit, but that the <laughs> JGit people can, can ship. Uh, you know, that we don't want to switch to a default format um, that's complicated and suddenly they're uh, you know, left holding the bag on if they want to keep compatibility, re-implementing a, a large system or a complicated database format in Java. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I just spoke about this a bit uh, with um, with Edward right before, mm -hmm. um, and he said that he's anxiously awaiting uh, for the like pluggable uh, ref backend. That's yeah, uh, and uh, especially as a Git hoster. You know, you're hurting when you have all these uh, large amounts of, of references, and now being able to put them in a database or something like that is going to be, uh, yeah, a, a lot better. There um, are a bunch of terrible things about refs. Uh, you know, no, no one ever, when Git was designed, no one ever thought you'd have more than a few refs. You know, you have some branches and you have some tags in a yeah. repository. Um, but uh, Carlos gave a talk from uh, GitHub's Git infrastructure team yeah. this morning about sort of all the weird corner cases we see. And I've, I've been slowly fixing these, you know, accidentally quadratic in the number of refs cases for, for years as we come across them. Um, but yeah, there are people who have 50,000 tags and you're like, eh, I mean, I guess it's not the worst thing you can do, but it's surprising to, uh, you know, it was never really how it was designed. So you have those cases, um, but then, you can run into some really crazy corner cases uh, with, uh, certainly at GitHub we see them with, uh, if you have a lot of refs and then you have a lot of forks on top of it, it's, it's the product of the two usually is how many refs we might ever have to deal with at one time when say doing uh, maintenance on the, um, on the shared object storage repo, that, that all, all the objects for all the forks are stored together. So at one moment we need to look at all the refs for all the forks and, mm -hmm. uh, and I, and that particular case with 50,000 tags, they also have a lot of forks. <laughs> and I, I think there's 80 million refs total. Oh, and nice. this is for a system that was thought to, you know, you'd probably have a couple hundred. Um, and so it's amazing that it performs as well as it does, frankly. Um, <laughs> but uh, it would be really nice for, to not load them all into RAM uh, immediately before mm. using them. It, it takes something like 12 or 13 gig of RAM just to, just to load the process and look at all the refs. Um, so, so there's those kinds of problems that are sort of on the crazy end, and I think the backend storage will really uh, help with that. But there are also problems 
that aren't storage related. For example, when you connect to a Git server, it, the first thing it does before the client can even say anything, the server says, here are all my refs. Oh. And if you have 50,000 tags, I don't, I don't recall what the exact size of that ref advertisement is, but it's probably a couple megabytes. So even to connect and find out, oh, there's nothing new to fetch, you have to, uh, to transfer a couple megabytes of, of data. Oh, wow. So those, those problems are, are challenging because um, we need to extend the protocol in some way. Uh, yeah. and, and Git has a capabilities mechanism that uh, lets, lets us be backward compatible while adding new capabilities. But the problem is that that uh, capability uh, mechanism only kicks in right after the server has advertised all of those refs. So it's great for anything except changing oh. <laughs> the ref advertisement. Um, and so we're, we're sort of figuring out what's the least the least incompatible way to move forward with a system where we can um, sort of gracefully probe the server and say, hey, I would like to tell you that I support this newer protocol, but, uh, but just in case you don't, it's okay, I can fall back to the other one, but without, without failing too hard you know, in, the, in the fallback cases. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion. There have been some patches. Uh, I actually have some patches I'm hoping to send in the next couple of weeks uh, in that direction. Uh, so we are, we're making progress uh, slowly on that stuff. So um, you said uh, that you kind of want to uh, find a, a way to plug in uh, 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 ref backends that mm -hmm. is more portable or uh, dependency elegant or something like that. But I, I, if you're doing this on the server at, at GitHub uh, servers, for example, uh, you got complete control right. over what's going to happen. Right. There, at GitHub, so. we don't care at all uh, about that. Um, it's, uh, and that's, that's why we didn't, one of, the, one of the, the important step is that we didn't say, oh, well, the old ref storage is bad and here's the new ref storage. That instead it said, let's virtualize the idea of ref storage and yep. let people plug in what they want to plug in. Um, and so, yeah, GitHub, uh, it ha we have, we're not using it internally yet, but like, I, I think the code is there in Git for us to now pick whatever database we feel like. Uh, you know, LMDB or something like that, and just plug it in and instantly start feeling feeling the the benefits. I think it it gets harder when you think about well, what should be the default that ships in Git? Uh, you know, should it be the this existing files file system backend, or should it be a database backend? Um, because that comes with a cost. If you're somebody, if you're somebody who just uses the Git client, that's fine. Um, but if you use Eclipse, for example, um, or uh, some of the um, some of the Git GUIs uh, use libgit2, for example. Yeah. And so, if uh, I know Kraken is is one of them that uses uh, libgit2 heavily. Um, uh, then until until libgit2 supports your ref, ref storage, then you're gonna have a lot of pain. So um, I, I guess that a client uh, will always you know default to use. Uh, I mean, for the over, I don't know how how many people out there are really suffering with their clients having too many refs. Right. Yeah. Most uh, clients don't matter that much. I mean, there are a lot of things to hate about the current ref storage. Um, it's performance is one thing. Um, it's complicated is another thing. Um, the original design was, well, you just have these loose refs. So every ref has its own file in the file system. And then that scales badly, especially with a cold cache where you're, you've got one inode per 40 byte file. Yeah. Um, and so to, to look at all the refs, you have to fault in all these inodes and, and it's, it can be quite long. So then we have packed refs for that. So sort of, it's sort of a compact storage for things that aren't changing much. But uh, the complexity of, well, I have to look at the loose refs and the packed refs, it it's not, doesn't seem that hard conceptually, but we have quite a few race conditions, for example, when you're dealing with, well, what if someone else is writing while you're looking at the refs and what state do you see? And could you ever accidentally uh, you know, look at the packed refs and then someone simultaneously deletes the loose ref and then updates the packed refs. So it, it, it basically the problem is you don't have an atomic view of the whole system. And so, mm -hmm. so these funny interleaved race conditions happen. It's very hard to reason about. And we ha had 
bugs that led to data loss at GitHub as a result of that. Most of those are fixed now. Uh, uh, I spent some time on it, and Michael Haggerty especially spent a lot of time on it in uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. So it's airtight now, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so there, there are a lot of things to dislike uh, with the complexity. Uh, it's also a limiting uh, format uh, in the, the sense that you can't store, because it's file system based, you can't store a directory and a file with the same, uh, or a, I should say a two files, one of which is a prefix of the other. Uh, so you can't have ref slash foo slash bar and ref slash foo, yeah. uh, because it can't be a file and a directory at the same yeah. time. And so for that reason, we don't keep ref logs for deleted refs, because the old ref log would get in the way of writing new refs. And then it would be really nice to keep ref logs for deleted yeah. refs because it's ref logs are meant to help you recover data in case you make a mistake. And yeah. one of those mistakes might be deleting the branch. Uh, uh, and and uh, gosh, I have a laundry list of these. Uh, <laughs> they're dependent on the case sensit sensitivity of your file system. Yeah, so yeah, if you have yeah. two branches with the differ only in case, they work fine on Linux, but not on yeah. Mac OS. So all of these things are. Um, that we could fix with a different back end. Obviously, putting things in a, in a database helps with them. But also, um, <laughs> <laughs> you can edit this later, right? Sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I forgot what I was. So yeah, so putting things in a database would, will help with those problems. But uh, uh, Michael especially has a lot of ideas for uh, having a file system based ref storage system that encodes funny cases, you know, yeah. uh, in a way that uh, uh, characters your file system might not be able to represent. Yeah. We, could, we could store in the file system as percent encodings or, or something like that. There are a lot of ways around this. I mean, you, we can still abuse the file system as a database if we choose. So basically, uh, the clients or the, like, let's say the normal Git users, they can uh -huh. get a, a, a more solid Git, you know, like with fewer bugs in it. Yes. That's probably a bit, maybe even less code altogether, although a database <laughs> might ship with it. Well, more code because we have to keep the backwards compatible code, but hopefully uh, less code that you're actually running. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but at least that they will have more features, basically, in the way they name things. Yes. Basically. Yeah, no, name, there could be some real usability improvements uh, yeah. uh, uh, as a result of this. Okay. Any other things from yesterday that uh, struck out? Like, okay, let's uh, move away from like the the core getting more into the uh, uh, surrounding community. Uh, there's like the software software freedom conservancy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any 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 news there that you want to share? Uh, well, I sent some uh, mail uh, messages to the mailing list. Uh, sort of one of them was trying to give us. Uh, I try to give a yearly report on the activities because a lot of. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do uh, is a sort of a private mailing list between Conservancy and the Git program committee, which is me and Junio and Sean. Um, and it's not, nothing we do is a big secret. It's just, it takes effort to relay all of that information to the mail, public mailing list. And so I tend not to do it. Um, and really not that much happens. That's interesting. Um, but I, uh, I tried to send a, uh, uh, at least once a year, just a kind of update on where we're at. Uh, one of the activities is we collect some money from various sources, uh, donations. We get some uh, royalties from uh, one of the publishers uh, of some Git books, uh, Pact Publishing, and, uh, and we get some Amazon. There's some Amazon affiliate links on the website, mm -hmm. and we, so we get some money from that, and we spend a little money. We help people travel to Git merge yeah. uh, and and other things, and uh, and so I give an outline of of those and the amounts, uh, how much how much money we have. It's Enough money that you sh we should care about caring for it carefully, but not enough to actually do anything really exotic or interesting. <laughs> it's about twenty thousand dollars U.S. Um, uh, uh, but the main activity I think we've done uh, is the trademark enforcement. So we have a trademark on Git, and uh, and we have to make decisions if somebody somebody comes to us and says, "Hey, can I call my my project?" get something or other, then we say, well, please don't, usually is the answer. Yeah. So, so um, now that you have the, the microphone, to tell the world, like, what is, uh, there's also this notion of grandfathering, uh, yes. like the things that were called get something already. Why, what is the point in time where that was kind of cut off and, and we say from now on, you're not allowed to 
call new stuff Git anymore? Is there a, a certain date? Uh, it, it's it's not a. I mean, there's not a particular date that we picked intentionally. It was mostly that we didn't. For most of Git's life, we used Git in a you know as a name and as, as, I hate to I hate to say brand because I, I don't think anyone consciously thought about brand, but uh, but, but clearly Git as a name is is a brand and is a thing that people know about. Yeah, and. Um, uh, we didn't pursue an actual trademark until <laughs> I should know the year, but I, I carefully researched the email I sent to the list. I think it was about two years ago. Okay. And um, and so we applied for the trademark, um, and we ran into yeah, we, obviously a lot of people were using the name sure. Git something or other already. You may have heard of GitHub. Yes. Uh, Git Lab. Git Minutes. Git Minutes. Oh yeah, you know I don't I don't know that uh, I don't know that <laughs> it's ever come come to the attention of the program committee. Um, but what uh, you know, in some cases, it wasn't even our choice if, if to make uh, GitHub trademark the name GitHub in 2008. Uh, and so uh, when we applied for the trademark, the patent office said, "No, this is confusingly similar to GitHub." Oh. And, uh, and we said, well, <laughs> you'll never guess where they came up with their name. Um, but uh, it, that, that one was actually resolved very easily. Uh, we, you know, we all had a laugh and uh, our, our lawyer talked to GitHub's lawyer, except that that sounds really formal. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was very easy to resolve for, yeah. for both parties to say, it's fine. Yeah. You know, we just have to tell the patent office that, that it's all fine. Documents were signed. Um, but then we kind of decided to do the same thing with, um, with other entities that had been using the name. Uh, GitLab was one of them. Um, Gitorious, uh, I think we did one with, for Gitolite. Uh, a lot of these projects that had been good community members, you yeah. know, hadn't, yeah. uh, you know, they, they were fine. The, the, the point of the trademark wasn't to corner the market on the name Git, it was to we didn't want to imply endorsement or association where it didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and we didn't, especially didn't want people to fork Git, keep calling it Git, but make it somehow broken. That just, or install malware on your or machine. Or install malware you're... on your machine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> SourceForge Git. Uh, but um, uh, so, yeah, so, so we grandfathered in sort of explicitly a lot of these cases, um, but said, well, going forward, we'd prefer not to. And that's actually one of the issues I raised in the email is it does create a, a, an unbalanced situation. You yeah. know, if, if, if you believe that there's a huge benefit to the name GitHub versus having to come up with some other random name, then GitHub is in an advantageous position versus somebody who's trying to start a GitHub competitor yeah. um, that, uh, that couldn't use a name with the word Git in it. Um, I don't know how much of a problem that is. Um, I don't know how much of an advantage the name is. Uh, obviously, lots of companies succeed with lots of random names, uh, yeah. but, um, uh, but it is a potential issue. Um, I, I think in the view of the Git program committee that we or pro I keep calling it the program committee. I believe it is the project leadership committee. Um, but we, our opinion is basically just, it's not ideal, but the alternatives are worse. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that, that granting all the names would probably not work and we can't de grandfather the other names <laughs> at this mm. point. Uh, so, so, uh, I mean, when I go around collecting links for, for Git revenues, oh, there's another one, by the way. <laughs> um, That's an official uh, <laughs> Git project. Uh, and, and there's like five tools every week that is called the Git something. Mm -hmm. So is, would it be better for all of these, or doesn't it matter if it's like a, a Perl script that does uh, some Git commands for well, you? Well, you know, if you're, if you're Git-foo, and you install yourself in the user's path as git dash foo so that people can run git space foo yeah. as, the, as the command, then, uh, I mean, we've very explicitly allowed that. That's git's extension mechanism. It's fine. A, a lot of it comes down to, um, to branding and marketing. You know, if you... If I'm selling something? If you're selling something, we're a lot less uh, yeah. interested, and especially if you're selling something that... If you're, if you're using the git name and implying association in a way that's 
advantageous to you, and especially financially advantageous, then that is more questionable. And right about there, the recording cut out, unfortunately. Anyhow, in spite of this little technical slip and, and getting these episodes out having taken so long, I'm happy to have finally finished uh, just in time before the Git Merge 2018 taking place in March. I'm not going to go there myself, so I'm counting on someone else to, to pick up the, the mic. It's a bit sad to be shipping uh, this episode, as it is probably the last Git Minutes episode ever. Um, to go a little bit down memory lane, uh, six years ago my, my daughter was born, and as I, I used a little of that paternity leave uh, to set up my podcasting infrastructure, and, and I produced the first few episodes. Um, initially it was just going to be ten episodes uh, of Git Minutes, and then call it a uh, uh, finished experiment. Uh, so, so now I, instead I've gotten to 46 episode, <laughs> episodes and the last uh, dozens or so have been lazily tailing the the last few git merge conferences. So kind of ran out of steam a, a little while ago so it's good to finally call it quits. I'd like to, to thank each and every one of my esteemed guests Thank you so much for, again, for coming on to the show and sharing your passion in this uh, little niche of uh, computer science and, and industry that we have here. I like to think that uh, I gave voice to some people working on the plumbing of how software development works and, and distributed uh, their voices out a little bit to a wider community. A big thanks to uh, my sponsor, DigitalOcean, they, they sponsored Git Minutes for, for a long time and, and hosted uh, me as well. You can still use the Git Minutes 1.0 uh, promo code when you sign up if you want. And uh, I hope that they will uh, leave this server running with the podcast archive as, as long as possible. <laughs> and when they don't bother anymore, then yeah, I'll have to think about getting a transfer to archive.org or something like that. Finally, I want to thank you, dear listener, for listening. I, I used to keep this uh, this list of tweets and emails and endorsements and, and encouragements uh, that I got for the podcast. And, and whenever there was like a dreary long episode of editing, and I'd some, sometimes uh, shift through uh, this, this list to give myself a, a motivation boost. And uh, when I look at that spreadsheet now where, where I collect them all, I, I know that I was able to help quite a few people uh, with with inspiration or, or, or technique or, or tricks or whatever to, to transition to Git or, or understand it or, or maybe just piquing their interest to having a deeper look into it. And uh, as somebody who's been blogging a long time before I started podcasting, I was mind blown about how rewarding it is to, to podcast and the engagement uh, that you get from the audience is just so much stronger and, and intimate in a way. So I hope that this won't be the last podcasting project that I do. Um, now I've started blogging again a bit more lately on on more kind of strategical uh, IT uh, company level things, uh, DevOps if you want, uh, a bit more of the cultural and transformation side of things. Um, if you want to see what I'm what I'm up to, you can follow me on Twitter to see what I'm up to next or, or uh, check uh, or, or follow check in on my homepage once in a while. On Twitter I am TFNICO or T F N I C O. And uh, if you add dot uh, com to that TFNICO then you'll get my homepage. Or you can yeah subscribe to my blog. Does anybody do that anymore? I'm not sure. If you are looking for another podcast about Git, there is an excellent one since uh, since uh, some uh, a couple of months ago. Edward Thompson and uh, Martin Woodward, they have both uh, been on this show. Uh, Edward was uh, in the previous episode, in fact, and Martin was like way back in one of the first 10 episodes, I think. So their podcast is called All Things Git. So just search around and and you'll find it. 
Finally, there's also a monthly uh, Git newsletter called Git Rev News. Um, you should check that out. I used to be uh, contributing to it, but now I've kind of retired from that as well. Uh, just search for Git Rev News. You'll find the homepage and you can subscribe from there and get nice, lovely updates from uh, the Git mailing list and uh, uh, kind of highlights and, and also a bunch of Git related links and, and news and releases. So I guess that's it. Um, thank you again for listening to the show and uh, yeah, I'll see you out there.